We worship our God by reading from his word. We do so this evening as we find it in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. The book of Numbers, chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his man that, is jo that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Selu, a prince of the chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Kozbi, the daughter of Zur, who was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and slay them, for they vex you with their wiles wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. So far we read from this word of God. We have as our text those verses that we read 7 through 13. I should have announced that I was not going to reread them. I apologize for that. But 7 through 13, where we first read of Phineas's action of taking a javelin and killing the man and the woman in the tent and staying or stopping the plague. A plague that killed, according to verse 9, 24,000 Israelites. Then, in verses 10 through 13, Jehovah's response to that, namely identifying Phineas's action as being zealous for God's sake, 
that God might not consume the children of Israel in his jealousy. And as a result, a covenant of everlasting priesthood was given to Phinehas. This incident of Baal Peor is one that the scriptures note many times. In fact, specifically 11 different times. The incident of Baal Peor is identified. It was a very significant event in the history of the children of Israel. The location was Peor in Moab. And Baal Peor is more a reference to the god Baal as he was worshipped in that location. And if you look at the scriptures and you look up Baal, you'll find Baal Hermon and Baal Peor and many other different Baals, followed by the name of a location. And that's because the variations, if you will, like dialects of a language, the variations of the worship of Baal was such that it was different in every place here. It was the worship of Baal Peor. And here, that worship of Baal was accompanied with sexual actions. A part of the worship was that in their giving of sacrifices, there was also adultery committed. Somewhat publicly, well known what was happening behind a tent, or in, behind the walls of a tent, but everyone knew that this was a part of the way in which Baal was worshipped, a part of the abomination. We consider that it was in that setting that Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, stepped forward. And in his zeal for God, Save the nation. In his zeal for God, he saved the church of the old dispensation from the plague that had begun to consume it throughout the nation. One last little note of introduction. There is no explanation that I could find for a variation in the number of those killed in the plague. Verse 9 is very clear, 24,000. This same incident is referred to in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 8, where it is identified as 23,000 that were killed. We'll leave to God to give harmony to that apparent discrepancy, and we will learn one day why those two numbers are there. We consider the sad setting for this zeal of Phineas, but we also want to consider the God-given response. The sad setting and then the God-given response. The 40 years of wilderness wanderings are almost completed. In fact, they're no longer in that wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. They have come around, they've gone all the way around the land of Edom, the descendant of Lot, because they were not allowed to pass through. So they went all the way around it. They crossed the river Arnon, which crossing might have been just like the Red Sea, a parting of waters. There is an implication of that. Just as it was at the Red Sea, so it was at the River Arnon, which is in the country now called Jordan. And they're coming up north, and then for the very first time, they have battles. Three battles. The first one is with Sihon, or with uh, Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, and another city. Now, 
the children of Israel are untrained yet as an army. So when they face this battle, this is an unusual activity on their part. And they're fighting against Og and Sihon were giants. So they're fighting against some who are giants. But the Lord gave them tremendous victories. And swelled somewhat by the victories. Living now, chapter 21 tells us, in villages and cities. So they're no longer moving in tents, but they're living and settled in houses. The pillar of cloud that led them had stopped. The tabernacle had been set up. And the millions of Israelites are taking a time of relative ease. The manna is still coming. That didn't stop until they crossed the Jordan River. The manna is still coming. They have conquered all the land on, of Canaan that's on the east side of Jordan by conquering these, three, these two kings and these three battles. And they're eating off the land and eating the manna. And things are relatively calm. And that's when the king of Moab, Balak, seeing what happened to Sihon and Og, decides he's not going to put his armies against that of Israel. And he knows, just as Rahab and the occupants of Jericho knew, that it was the God of Israel that had brought them out of the land of Egypt 40 years before, and decided that he was not going to pit his army against Israel. He recruited the help of Balaam. Balaam came three times. He looked over all of the inhabitants of Israel, the nation, tried to curse the whole, and then a part, and then just the very edges of Israel. And every time, his curse became a blessing. But the scriptures tell us that Balaam wasn't finished. And even though it seems from what we find here in the earlier part of Numbers that Balaam went home with his tail between his legs, that nevertheless, that was not the case. It was at Balaam's advice, chapter 31, Verse 16, through the counsel of Balaam, the children of Israel fought against the Midianites and Moabites, but they saved the women in their battle. Moses and Eliezer and the princes of the congregation went forth and met the conquering army of Israel outside of the camp. Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, the captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Therefore now kill every male among the little ones and every woman that hath known man by lying with him. Balaam hated Israel. And when he couldn't get God to curse Israel, he made it his conscious effort to try to make Israel curseable in the eyes of God. And he knew how to do that. Get them to worship other gods. And get them to do that by being friends with them. Send in your women, your beautiful daughters, even you princes, especially you leaders, send in your beautiful daughters, send in your handsome sons. Let them mingle. Let the purpose of the relationships. I have to remember, 
Relationships in themselves are not sins. The sinfulness of a relationship is determined by what happens in the relationship and the purpose of it. The intent of these relationships was to get them to worship their gods, their Baals. And they did. In the book of Hosea, chapter 9, in verse 10, we read this. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. Their abominations were according as they loved. There's two possible ways to understand that expression. The one way is, as I have loved them, now I hate them. God's words. But other way to look at it is this, that as they fell into their love relationships with these Baal worshipers, and therefore they fell into the abominations with their love for these Baal worshipers. That life of ease, relaxation, that, that high that they had at being able to conquer all this land with relative ease, with just three battles. Highs are often followed by lows. The high of Jericho was followed by the low of Ai. And many times in the course of our lives, when God gives us a positive strength and victory, that's when we have to watch out the most. Because there can come the dip and the low afterwards. That low came for the whole nation. The nation as a whole was at ease. The error... The error of Balaam is that when he thought he couldn't get God to curse Israel, that he could make Israel curseable, his error was that he thought that he could get God to change his mind about Israel. And if we learn anything, it's not highlighted, it's not mentioned, but the very clear implication of the word of God concerning this is that God's attitude towards his children, individually and collectively, does not change. His covenant cannot be altered, nor the word that proceeds out of his mouth. The relationship that he establishes with us in Christ is an eternal, an eternal covenant of grace. And that attitude of God towards his children is not determined and not conditional. That doesn't give us any license to sin, but only reason for greater gratitude. It makes our sins uglier, but Balaam's error was thinking that God's grace was conditional and changeable. The sin that took place within the nation affected the nation as a whole. From the top to the bottom. Throughout the whole of the nation. Now there are estimated to be between two and three million Israelites. But nevertheless when 23 or 24,000 of them are killed in a plague, we see a general problem. Deuteronomy 
chapter 4. Moses, at the very beginning of his speech, remember all of Deuteronomy is Moses' speech to the children of Israel just before he dies. Deuteronomy 4, in verses 3 and 4, he says and he reminds them of this event. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. That plague was very pointed and directed. The God who controls all things, the God whose eyes see and know everything, brought that plague on just the guilty ones. Just the guilty. But again, 23, 24,000 were guilty. They forgot the relationship that God had established with them. They forgot what that relationship of God with them meant for them. They forsook that relationship and they turned themselves to the ease, to the pleasures that they had for themselves. Many of the leaders also were guilty. Verse 4 tells us, The sin was a, was a public sin. And because the place of worship for Israel was around the tabernacle of the congregation, these Women and men who came in and wanted to convert the Israelites to the worship of Baal and to the abominations connected with it performed the activity of worship to Baal not off in the outskirts of the camp but right near the tabernacle of the congregation. And so when Zimri and Kazbai perform this sinful act, it was before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He deliberately was insulting God. And, if you notice this very carefully at the end of verse 6, he was deliberately insulting those Israelites who in their grief and sorrow occasioned by the plague, were expressing their sorrow publicly to God. They weren't staying in their tents. They had gathered before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they were weeping as an expression of their sorrow. And it was before them too, flaunting them, despising them, that Zimri, the Simeonite prince went before them in order to commit this public shame. Let's not overlook the fact that when the scriptures give names, especially of women, that's noteworthy, either positively or negatively. And by making their names, Zimri and Kazbai, to be known forever in the generations of those who read the scriptures. God is pointing his finger of judgment on them. It was in that kind of a setting that God comes to Moses. His wrath is kindled against the whole the awareness of responsibility of the body there may have been some who were specifically guilty we read at the end of verse 4, God's anger 
wasn't just against them. But his wrath was on the whole of the congregation. As in the body, there are many members, but they're all connected. So God wanted them aware and wants us aware that there's relationships and there's responsibilities. Even, even when we might not ourselves be participating in the sin, Why is God's anger kindled? Let us never, never say anything but the right answer. It was because God loved Israel. Because God loved his church. That which confused Balaam to think he could make Israel curseable would also confuse him when he saw bad things happening to Israel, such as 24,000 killed in a plague. So there's buried in a huge cemetery or a huge pit, one or the other, these 24,000 bodies of adults. He would have concluded, God is angry. Yes, God is angry. But that anger is an expression of his love, just as the rod in the hand of the shepherd or of the faithful, God-fearing parent. God can show his favor in more ways than in positive things. God's way of blessing is one of constant blessing, in all things, we read it. He made an eternal covenant of grace with us. He either averts evil or he turns it to our profit. Blessing isn't just in a healthy baby. The blessing could just as well have been in a miscarriage or no children. He never stops blessing. Always. His love determines that blessing. Here, God demanded Christian discipline on those leaders who were sinning. God had expressed in his law, the given to, through Moses at Sinai, that the correct way to perform excommunication, Old Testament excommunication, was this. You stone them, and then you hang their dead bodies until the sun sets. That was God's command. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Those leaders, those rulers who are guilty are to be killed by stoning by the judges and then to have their bodies hung. God doesn't give us always the perfect sequence of events, but it would seem that after the public display of God's judgment on those leaders who had forsaken God completely and fell into total worship of these idols, that after that, Zimri, wanting to flaunt the judgments of God, came forward with cause by. God sent a plague. The plague is wrecking havoc among the people. Now again, they're scattered far and wide in a huge area, but the judgment of God is racing through the nation, killing seemingly very, very quickly all those who were guilty. Not the observers didn't know who was guilty. God did, but they saw death 
running through the camp and taking more and more, spreading. And then they see Kazbai take Zimri, or Zimri take Kazbai into this tent in the front of the tabernacle. and in front of the eyes of those that are weeping. Let's consider those who stood at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation weeping. They wept. for what was happening to Israel. But their tears weren't for somebody else's sin, but for their own. They were confessing to God that they participated in that which occasioned the judgment, the ease, the pride. Achan committed the sin at Jericho. God's judgment was on the whole of the nation. Thirty-six families grieved because of the death of their fathers and husbands. But God made it clear to the whole nation because they had swelled in pride and said, we don't need to take very many against little old Ai. If we could take Jericho that easily, we can take Ai. They sinned in their pride. And these, this is the kind of weeping that was at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They were conscious that they were sinners before God, that they didn't deserve any blessing from Him. And they were confessing and seeking pardon for themselves and for the whole because they believed that their sin, their own sin, would not go unpunished. They saw the other sin, but that made them aware of what they deserved. Am I free from sin? Maybe I'm not committing the gross sin. But am I free from sin? Such stood and wept. God's mercy brought the plague. God's mercy worked repentance in the heart of those who stood at the door of the tabernacle. And God's mercy gave the gift of zeal for God to Phineas. He exercised that holy zeal for God by taking a javelin, entering into the tent, and killing both Zimri and Kozbi together. And that stopped the plague. What was so extraordinary about Phineas's act is that such judgment is not the duty of the organized nation of Israel, in organized Israel, by a priest. It should have been the judges that did it. But when this public act takes place, Phineas not only performs something that was not his specific duty to do as a priest of God, but which also, as far as he was aware, made him worthy of being cast out of the office of priesthood. He was not to do anything with a dead body, let alone kill. In his zeal for God, 
See how it's worded in Psalm 69 and we sang it? The zeal for thy abode hath consumed me. His zeal is not only evidenced in his willingness to get rid of the sin, the public sin, but also his willingness to sacrifice himself, his position, his rights as a grandson of Aaron to be the priest. Phinehas well knew of the death of his older uncles, Nadab and Abihu. His father, Eliezer, was set to become high priest. Because Nadab and Abihu had died. So the thirdborn son of Aaron is now set to be the high priest. And he after, he was willing to sacrifice that privilege. Because he saw what the anger of God was doing to the camp. For Israel. That's why we read that he made atonement for Israel. In verse 13, he made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now, there are different atonements. This cannot be an atonement of expiation of sin. That can't be the case. Because only Christ is able to fulfill that type of sacrifice and take away the sins of others. And that, the one who had Phineas' zeal, of whose zeal Phineas was a picture and type, Jesus did it. But Phineas' atonement was an appeasing of God's wrath when he removed the cause of God's wrath in killing Zimri and caused by. And God rewarded Phineas' zeal. That's why the language about the covenant of peace and the covenant of an eternal priesthood, he had sacrificed that right to be a priest. And when God comes back and says to him, though you by what you did don't deserve it anymore. Just like everyone with whom I established my covenant never deserves it. But I will continue it in my grace, in my peace. You don't deserve peace because you've touched bodies and you've killed. But I will continue my covenant of peace. There's not a problem. There's not a war. There's not a conflict between me and you, Phineas. That's what God is saying to him. You may seem to have lost that privilege, but I will establish that priesthood in your generations forever. Now, when he says forever, of course, then it's not in an Aaronitic priesthood, but it's in a priesthood that's after the order of Melchizedek from the tribe of Judah, not Levi, that Christ comes. And in him is that priesthood fulfilled forever. Phineas, the incident of Cosby, the incident of Baal Peor, Cosby and Zimri. But Phineas is zeal. What do we learn? First of all, this. It is interesting that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 8, the sin that's highlighted in the reference to this event is not idolatry, but adultery. Not idolatry. A horrible sin but it's adultery. Let us learn that the devil in all of his attacks especially uses times of ease in Zion. He uses times of highs to attack in a different way. We pray for the persecuted saints. 
I've often heard that the persecuted saints pray for the church and Western civilization as they must maintain their faith in the midst of such prosperity. I thank God for those prayers. We need them. Just as we have to be aware of the dangers and temptations that the devil sends our way in this kind of a setting. But it was, it was for the sin of idolatry too. When the children of Israel had gained the victories and the two and a half, finished all the fighting and conquering Canaan and the two and a half tribes are going back, when they go back to the, land, to the east side of the Jordan River and establish their homes there, go back to their wives and children and cattle, they set up an altar that's totally misunderstood by all the other tribes. And it is in that setting, Joshua 22, that representatives from all of the other tribes, led by Phineas, come to the two and a half tribes. They come to the children of Rumid and the children of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh and the land of Gilead and they spake unto them saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord and that you have builded you an altar? Now they built an altar there on their side of the river Jordan River, because they wanted the other generations, the, the injured generations, the children of the other tribes, to say, we worship just like you worship. We're worshiping the same God. They weren't intending to use the altar, but they wanted the other generations, the, the following generations of the other tribes, to know, we're worshiping God the same way. We're one with you. The ten and a half tribes looked at that altar and said, you do this, you are rebelling against the Lord. And then they said this, Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord? And it will be, seeing ye, that, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Oh, the two and a half tribes were able to answer. But Phineas and those representatives of the other tribes pointed out this incident of Baal Peor. Don't forget what happened. We are not wanting it to be repeated. That's why we come. The zeal for Phineas, of Phineas is also our example. His zeal was for the whole. His zeal was for God. His zeal was for God's jealousy. But the real character of his zeal was not that he was ready to fight for God, but that he was ready to lose his own office for God. That was his zeal. James and John, sons of thunder, were pretty zealous too. And once they asked Jesus, can you send fire down from heaven on these Samaritans because they didn't receive you? Jesus shook his head and said to them, you don't know what zeal, is, what spirit has been given to you. Fervent zeal is like anger. You better be really careful with it. In, in heat of a moment, we who are still in all of our natures so totally depraved can, and this is the devil knows it, can just like that slip from being right to being deadly wrong. Zeal is good, but that zeal 
must, that receives God's approval must be zeal with knowledge and with mercy. Otherwise it is to be condemned. But we see this zeal fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who for God's name and for God's truth and for God's church was willing to sacrifice and did sacrifice himself. That's zeal. That's the right kind of zeal. Not so that I can have a name, so that I can be known as being zealous. People are going to remember me. No. Right zeal consumes us. Be so concerned about the body. So concerned about the church. So concerned about God and His truth and His glory that we're ready to sacrifice ourselves. Paul had that zeal. For my kinsmen and my brethren, according to the flesh, I would that I were accursed. Jesus was consumed, He died that we might live. And we live. May we so live to his glory and honor. Amen. Our Father, we are thankful for thy word. Show in this biblical event thy glory, thy wisdom, thy eternal covenant of grace and peace. We stumble and stammer. We struggle to know what's the right way. But thy relationship to us is unaltered and unaffected. We may experience it in a different way, but in thy wisdom thou dost care for us, thy children. We thank thee for that unchanging, burning love that thou hast for us that gave thy son, and he gave himself. What grace, amazing grace that is. In Christ's name we pray, amen.